All in the name of friendship. Thank you so much. Yeah. Shall I sit here? Yes, you can sit there. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you can come to Oh, thanks a lot. <laughs> Appreciate it. Can I uh, move it so I can face the wonderful people? Oh, uh, yeah, for sure. Let me just grab the corner. Thank you. It's very sensitive, so don't worry about having to yeah. lean into it. No, okay, <laughs> thank you. All right, so uh, I'd like to begin by uh, greeting you all with the Islamic greeting. So the Islamic greeting uh, in Arabic is Assalamu. Alaikum, which means peace be upon you. And uh, this is actually the topic, peace through Islam, right? So I was, uh, first I was approached by Imam Shakib, which I believe he came here a couple of times, and he said that he will not be available, so he suggested I should go. I said, yeah, ever ready. And then I was contacted by another, another uh, sister uh, named Anusha. Is that correct? And uh, she started uh, asking about uh, the topic and so on and so forth. And then she said the topic is peace through Islam. So I was excited, uh, and I will tell you why in a second. But then she said there is another imam. I sent him a message, the same message, the same invitation, same day, same topic. Uh, and she's waiting for his response. Uh, and his name was Imam Parker. So now, there are four Imam Parkers in town. There are actually five. Four brothers and one has no relationship, but his last name is also Parker. There is Salman Parker, Ahmed Parker, Abdullah Parker, and Safdar Parker, and Yusuf Parker. <laughs> now, two of them are my colleagues in the same school, same department. Uh, so I should wish them good, right? But no, I was actually praying that I hope they will not give back to Anusha because I wanted to come and speak about that topic because that topic is very dear to my heart personally. Peace through heart, uh, through Islam. Because I grew up in Egypt and m most of my life in Egypt, I did not really practice religion. I, I didn't have a passion for religion or spirituality at all. All what conquered my heart and life and time at that, uh, at that time back then was music. Music, singing, and, and so on. So that was my, my passion. So, uh, and, and my definition of peace was different. So peace for me was if I became famous, make money, uh, people would run after me, autographs and, and the like, uh, peace would be, of course, definitely achieved. So I was running all my life, ups and downs, just to uh, achieve that. God said no. No, it didn't work. So I, I tried all, all, all my uh, youngster, younger years in Egypt uh, trying to become famous. It didn't work. And uh, something happened, without going into details, something traumatic happened in Egypt at that time that made me reflect over leaving the country. And uh, before leaving the country, I came across uh, a lady all the way in Hong Kong city. So I was in Egypt chatting, and all of a sudden a lady popped up from Hong Kong city or China uh, talking to me, and we got to talk, and I started feeling for her. She felt for me, and uh, this is the lady at the back, by the way, my wife. So we got to know each other, and she came down to Egypt. We, uh, we, we, we arranged everything, and we got married, and we moved to Hong Kong. So in Hong Kong, I decided, all right, so now it's my time. Nobody understands Arabic. I should now sing and make money. And that was my passion. Again, music. So a band was formed. I got to know a lot of people in Hong Kong who also uh, are passionate about music and dancing. And we hit the market, and I started making really money. So I could see now my dream is coming closer and closer and closer. Uh, and I really enjoyed uh, the time a lot in, 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 at that stage until I felt, again, there is an empty space. It's, it's not now about making money. It's about more than that. I, I need more. I need fame. I need... So uh, there was always a driven emotions around becoming more. The more you have, the more you want to have more. Uh, until I, uh, I asked the band members, uh, who is the most popular singer in this, in this state, you know, in this city? So they said a man by the name of Leslie Chung. 
I'm not sure if anyone familiar with that name, but Leslie Chung was at one point uh, titled as Asian biggest superstar. So stadiums would be filled with people to attend his concerts and movies and so on. All right, I said, that's the man. So I'm gonna compete with this guy. So I kept doing all what I can to arrive at that level. And in the middle of all the struggle, uh, Leslie Chung killed himself. He, he threw himself from the Mandarin Hotel in Hong Kong City. And I remember that day like yesterday because I was watching the news and then I saw a black ribbon comes on TV and announcing the death of Leslie Chung, the man who I was trying to compete with, who I thought that he achieved already that piece because you have all the money in the world, you have all the fame in the world, you have, uh, he's handsome, he's, everybody's around him. So I thought that this is peace. So that was my definition of peace at the time. But all of a sudden, it turns into depression now. It turns into deep, dark sadness in my heart. Like, how could that person leave everything behind, leave all these things that he had achieved and just kill himself? Like, where, and he left a note in the hotel room. He left a note, and that note was one word, depression. So couldn't money, fame, and all these thrilling channels offer him anything other than depression. So I was like, I myself was left really reflecting over this. And that was the first slap on my face about looking at life differently and redefining really peace. And uh, in, in, again, fast forward six months into this struggle, ups and downs, uh, I decided to pray. So, and I uh, forgot to mention my wife was a Catholic. So she used to go to church, I used to go with her. And uh, as I mentioned, I, I didn't really care about religion at that time, but because I love the missus, I have to, you know, show that I, <laughs> show I care about what she do. So I go to the church and whatever they do there, I would just imitate, but nothing was moving me from inside. Uh, so one day I decided, okay, let's pray. I, I'm a Muslim, that's what I know for sure. I was born, my family uh, told me how to pray and when we were young, so let me pray, let me try this prayer. And this is, this is where everything started after and the changes that happened uh, around me and my family, my wife especially, is that I prayed. And uh, when I prayed, uh, probably you have seen Muslims praying and uh, they stand, they bow, and they prostrate where they put their forehead and nose on the ground. Uh, and I was in that position, unaware that my wife actually was observing me from behind and and, and she started asking me, why, why are you doing this? Why are you praying this? And we, we had a long conversation around salah or prayer in Islam. And my wife asked me to, uh, to uh, if she could pray with me in that same fashion. I said, sure. And I printed the former prayer from, her, uh, from the internet and I gave it to her and we started praying together. And in the process, when she, when she touched the ground, uh, in that position of prostration, I heard her crying. And it hits me like, I've been like living in Egypt for many, many years, seeing people praying, and I never seen someone crying uh, who never even experienced the Islamic prayer before. So I was like reflecting why such a person would cry in that position. So, uh, and later on she wrote a big article about the prayers in Islam and how God should be praised and worshiping and coming closer to, 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 to that spiritual being through prostration because prostration in Islam is bringing your highest point of your body on the lowest of the low to humble yourself before the one who made you, the creator who fashioned you in that way. So it was very, very um, emotional moment for both of us. And uh, from that day onwards, I started looking into Islam seriously. I'm still, I'm still into my lifestyle, music, you know, bars and all these um, places. I was still into music, but at the same time, there is part of me saying that, uh, why can't we have it both? Like, why can't I be religious, focusing on spirituality, and at the same time having it also to make money and become famous and the like? It didn't work out, so, though, later on. But what happened, what happened is that um, I came across one uh, teaching in Islam that stopped me really. Uh, and that is when the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, migrated from Mecca to Medina. So he migrated, he left home, he left everyone behind, he left many, many things behind, his, his beloved city, uh, because the people there 
could not swallow the fact that he's calling them to worship one God and stay away from uh, other you know, deities and so on. So he left because they were torturing him and his companions. Many people ki were killed in the process. So he left the city peacefully and he went to Medina. And the first teaching, the first speech he had in Medina was, all people. So he, would, uh, he was addressing three or four categories of people. He was addressing the Muslims there with him. He was also addressing the inhabitants of Medina. He was in, uh, addressing the Jews and the Christians of the same city. And he was obviously also addressing people who worship idols and worship other deities. So he addressed everyone, all people. The first sentence he's, he uttered, Afshu salam. And when I came here, the first thing I greeted you with was, Assalamu alaikum. Peace be upon you. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was actually advising and encouraging people to spread peace. The first words he uttered when he left his home and he went to Medina is, Afshu salam, wasilul arham, and connect ties with your family members. And as a result, at the end of this narration, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, if you do that, you will achieve the greatest rewards peacefully. And that is we call paradise or Jannah in Arabic. And immediately I realized that, ah, oh, so we shouldn't really run after peace. We shouldn't, we shouldn't go to hunt for peace. Rather, we should spread peace. We should bring, bring peace into our lives. And only then, really, we can achieve that peace. That was the beauty of how Islam deal with this issue. It's not about me looking for something that will make me happy and, and satisfied and content. It's what I will really bring to people and to myself. So contentment was that one lesson that hits me a lot and made me make my decision to shift from all my desires that I have for money, for fame, for this and that, and focus really on my, my, my being and my spirituality and my duties and, and obligations toward my creator. There, there are a lot to share really, and I, I don't want to make it uh, sounds like a lecture. I'm trying to ramble here to share with you my, my, my personal story so that you can perhaps come up later with question and answer. So. Um, so w when you look into uh, also the, the, the Qur'an and how God Almighty mentioned um, throughout the Qur'an that he had prepared the abode of peace for those who bring peace on earth. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said that if you show mercy, compassion, and peace to people on earth, the one in heaven, referring to God Almighty, will show you mercy and peace later on. Because... We may debate so many things, right? But the thing that we really don't debate, because it's, uh, it's a fact that we all observe, is death. We know that one day we will leave here and go somewhere else. So we don't debate that uh, fact, because we all experience it, irrespective of our backgrounds. So God said that if you really bring peace to people, to the creation, God will bring you that peace later on when you needed it the most. That, that's how Islam respond to, to this issue of peace that, uh, you know, that we are yearning for. Like when, when you look uh, around the world and see wars and see people dying and see children dying and see people uh, leaving their countries and, and, and you know, uh, going around just hoping for some mercy, hoping for some place to, you know, find that tranquility and peace. We, we are bleeding from inside out. Right? So I, I pray that all of us will, will have that heart to bring peace to ourselves and to bring peace to others. I was in the Philippines uh, some years ago. And this is something, again, personal story that also bring a, brought to me that idea of you now peace is what we create. And if we don't, we shouldn't blame anyone but ourselves. So I was in the Philippines. Uh, also with my family, and uh, it, it was a conference tour around some cities in the Philippines, and we landed in Manila after visiting a few cities. We landed in Manila, final leg in Manila, 
and uh, the organizer said we're gonna have lunch so we went to the restaurants and I had my backpack had my laptop everything including my passport and all that and I, uh, I asked the driver shall I leave the, the bag in the car is it safe he said yeah it's safe place secured uh, CCTV camera and whatnot all right I don't have doubt uh, you know in, in his uh, advice so I left everything we went for lunch 20 minutes later I saw the driver almost in tears. He says, somebody broke in, and the bag is just gone. Now, this, and it, all my work is on the laptop, iPad, a lot of things. There were a lot of cash as well. And my passport, that's the, the terrible part was my passport. And our flight was the next day. Our flight, flight back home was the next day. Now, my wife, because uh, she's very smart, she kept her passports in her own personal bag. <laughs> <laughs> wherever she go. Uh, so I was left, I was left in, in, you know, this story took me to four months in the Philippines before I get a new passport to leave and go back home. On, on that same day, I'm supposed to stand on a stage and talk about contentment. <laughs> that was the topic of the entire conference, contentment. So I was, I was uh, my son also at that time was very young and he lost his iPad and he was distressed, you know, iPad, come on. It's like he, iPad and these devices like the third hand now, like, you know, as if you're chopping the hands if you take it out. But the point is, we were all like in that state of like, what, what are we going to do? Like, we were all in, in that state of shock. And then uh, as I went to the uh, bathroom just to refresh myself and uh, think and... Uh, I found in my, in my pants, I found actually the notes of the lecture, contentment. And then in it, there was a quote that if you really uh, trusted, if you trusted the destiny, that which has been written already beforehand, then God will substitute that with something way better. So all, all what you need to do is to surrender, which is actually the meaning of Islam. What is the meaning of Islam in the first place? Is to submit and to surrender your own desires, your own will to the will of the one who made you. Because he knows better. He's the one who fashioned you. So immediately I went out. I remember talking especially to my son. I said, listen, the most important thing is that we are together. It could have been worse. And uh, interestingly, I had a dream the night before. I was a really terrible dream. And... Uh, uh, in it, some, some, one of my family members was harmed. So I said, if, if this gun, if these things gone in exchange of, you know, I have my family with me and we are all safe, then uh, I don't mind. And I started the lecture that night with this story to tell the people that contentment. We have to be satisfied from, the, from our heart because God will put us into these te tests and difficulties uh, because he wanted, he wanted to, to see who are really the truthful and honest slaves of his. Who are the, the ones really that are in peace within themselves and in peace with others. No matter how difficult life may seem, there will be always light at the end of the tunnel. That's Islam. Basically, the meaning of Islam itself comes from the same root word, salam. When I offered you salam, that's actually the universal greeting that we exchange. In fact, the word salam is a word that we use in the beginning of the greeting. So when I meet you, I say salam. And when I salute you and I leave, I say also the same thing. Assalamu alaikum. It disarm. It's, it's a supplication. I'm saying may peace be upon you. In fact, it's, it's part of a longer greeting. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May peace, mercy, and blessing. From God Almighty be upon you, to disarm you, like, to, to make you feel that I'm not here to harm you, I'm here to offer you peace and calmness and tranquility. That's Islam. These are the thoughts that came to me, and finally I will end with one beautiful uh, narration of the, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, where he mentioned, excuse me, when someone came to him and advised him, like, um, give me advice. So the, man, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, don't be angry. So the man said again, give me another one. So the Prophet Muhammad responded, don't be angry. 
All right, I heard that. I heard that the first time. I'm giving you a third one. I said, don't be angry. Uh, you can you can look at this and 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 what and ask ourselves like, what type of religion is that that the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, the man who's responsible for for this religion. What kind of religion is that that advise people not to get angry? Because once we are angry, we don't we don't think rationally. We don't think clearly. We start saying things that are not nice, that hurt people. See, they say the tongue has got no bone, right? It's got no bones, but it is strong enough to break a heart. True or false? How many divorces happen just because of a moment of anger? This is Islam. So I hope that uh, this brief reminder uh, would serve us all a lesson for life, that, uh, that peace is to be brought by our own contentment in the heart and not something that we should hunt for and run after. Because the more you run after something, the more you run after your desire, you will end up nowhere. Because our desire will take us really into... Um, and this is something that... Sorry if I'm again rambling. <laughs> and, um, no, because we, we don't, we, there, is no, there is no really limits to our desires. And if we are left to our own thoughts and desires, I believe the entire world would be corrupted. Because uh, who caters for how many billion people are, 1.7 billion people? And like, who, everyone will come with his own desire and ideas, and as a result, things will be ruined. So peace is to be brought by our own choices through contentment in the heart to please the one who made us, the creator of heavens and earth. Thank you so much for listening. And I would love to, Yanni, if you have any questions or anything about Islam in general, about anything, I would love to entertain that in, uh, if you don't mind. Anything at all. Thank you. So uh, I have a rule for question and answer. Everything goes. So anything you want to say, please don't hold back. Alrighty. If you thought that it is offensive, that's the most important question for me. So please, anything at all. Well, that's quite the invitation. So if anyone anything. has a question, good on you. Start the question time. Uh, forgive me if it hurts or anything, but this is what I feel. Okay. According to you, and I know Islam is a very peaceful religion. But how come it's not practiced in the world? You can come and preach here because this is a very peaceful country. Take, for example, Islamic countries. We can't have a Buddhist temple. We can't even pray inside the house. Yes. So what are you doing to resolve those kinds of issues? Okay. We don't have problems here. I, I, I much appreciate your speech, and I loved it. But being such a peace-loving religion, they kill people, and they, they say, Allah Akbar. Right? Yes. So it's very confusing to us. I will clear that confusion, inshallah. Okay. God willing. Okay. Thank you. First of all, I'm not the king of Saudi Arabia, okay? So I don't want you to <laughs> I don't want you to punish me for the sins committed by the king of Saudi Arabia. Now look, the, the, the same thing applies to Muslims, by the way. Same thing. We complain about uh, some Muslim countries who don't give us freedom to preach Islam, to teach Islam, to pray regularly. Yeah, they open the mosques five times a day, but in between we are under watch. In Dubai, the same thing, in Saudi Arabia. So we are restricted in the same way how other religious uh, uh, figures or religious uh, people are restricted. So it's not only on certain religions. It's not like we're targeting uh, or the, the governments are targeting uh, different religious uh, communities. In fact, in Saudi Arabia today, you'll see that there are many scholars, Muslim scholars, are behind bars because they speak the truth. They wanted actually this kind, these types of freedom. They themselves wanted that freedom. So uh, I, I, can't, I can't really um, speak about people. What I can say is what my religion taught, 
what Islam brought, what Muhammad, peace be upon him, practiced. Yeah? That's what I can, uh, this is what I can say. Uh, in, in different other parts of the world, we see Hindus, for example, harming Muslims. Uh, in Myanmar, you have probably heard Buddhists harming Muslims. We can't now attribute these crimes or these scenes to the, the founders who brought that system to us. We can't say Buddha is this. We can't say Krishna is this. What we say is that people don't, didn't understand the message and they are, they are behaving in a manner that's cont contradictory to those religions and those people and those figures. So we cannot really blame a system for the mistakes and the crimes of the people who abuse that system. I don't agree that, um, that uh, we, we, we should not have temple in the Muslim world. We, we have, by the way, in, in several countries. Yeah, we have in Dubai. We have also in Malaysia. Have you been to Malaysia? Yeah, but I mean, I mean, majority Muslim country. Yeah. Indonesia, majority Muslim country, they, they also have. So, so the point is, it's not that every Muslim, and, and Indonesia, by the way, is the, uh, uh, the biggest Islamic country in the world in terms of population. Not Saudi Arabia, not the Middle East at all, not even any country in the Middle East. So in Egypt, I don't know if, uh, my country, we grew up, churches, uh, Jewish synagogue, are there, and uh, even though with the clashes that happened between Egypt and Israel at one point and wars and all that, still there were Jewish there worshiping, and actually they, they, they were our neighbors on the streets. The bottom line, just to uh, make this clear, is that Islam did not uh, prevent people from worshiping whatever they wanted to worship. Islam did not come to eliminate other religions. In fact, Umar ibn Khattab, one of the leaders in Islam after the demise of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, went to Jerusalem after the conquest of Jerusalem at that time, and he guaranteed the Christians and the Jews to worship in the, in, in, in the mosques and synagogues. Not a single church was demolished, not a single uh, Jewish temple was, was demolished. Everything was left for the people to worship, and no one forced them to become Muslims. So that's the rule in Islam. Anyone would abuse that it's them to blame, not, not the religion, not the system itself. I hope that this is clear, yeah? Is it? A little bit? I hope. Has anyone else got a question they'd like to ask? Yep. Salam. Wa alaikum salam. My question is only like quite a small one uh, in comparison. I was just sort of curious, uh, when you refer to Allah as he, is that more sort of like a term of convenience um, in, in Islam? Is, is God considered male or sort of like beyond gender? Okay, so no, it's, it's, a, it's a language thing. So in language, we don't have any pronoun to describe the holiness of God except that pronoun. Uh, God t uh, said in the Quran, in introduction about himself, he say, tell them, O Muhammad, he is Allah, God, the one and only, the one and eternal. He begets not, and he was not begotten. So he don't have children, he, will, he has no beginning. And the, the other, the fi final verse, explain now about the gender thing. And there is none comparable to him. So whatever you compare God to is not God. He's something different than males, different than females. But language-wise, I think the, that's the only pronoun that can uh, explain uh, something about God Almighty, but has nothing to do with gender. In fact, we uh, uh, always debate Christians about this because in uh, Christianity, uh, w when, when God, uh, God created man in his own image. So we take a strong exception about this because uh, that would give us an idea that God looked like me, like a man. Uh, in Islam, God doesn't look like anyone and he's completely different than his creation. Thank you. You're welcome. Would you, anyone else like to ask a question? Okie doke, because I shall ferry my way to the back. Yes, uh, I'd like to know the difference between uh, Sunni, uh, Shiite, and Sufi. 
Wow. And had I <laughs> feel like my PhD uh, <laughs> discussion session. That's a whole thesis, Bill. <laughs> All right. So the the diff the main difference between the Sunnis and the Shia is in terms of leadership after the demise of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So the Sunnis believe that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, gave enough indications that Abu Bakr, who was his best friend during his lifetime, should lead the Muslim nation after the demise of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. However, the Shia, who were mostly from the family members of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, believed that Ali ibn Abi Talib, who was the cousin of the Prophet Muhammad, وسلم, peace be upon him, should become the leader. And from there comes the clash and the differences. Uh, that's the main difference, actually. But we follow the same Quran, we pray the same prayers, and so on. Unfortunately, for, politi for political reasons, the differences became bigger and bigger and larger. And, uh, and not only that, but animosity grew uh, in, in certain parts of the world between Sunni and Shia, which is really unfortunate. Sufis, on the other hand, are, they are Muslims, uh, but they have, they have developed certain practices that go beyond the norm. Like it's very difficult to become Sufi because they, they look at this world as nothing. So they don't wanna uh, work enough, they don't wanna uh, care about worldly positions, worldly uh, desires and all that, and focus purely on praising and worshiping God for longer hours, fasting for longer days. So Sufism is uh, a form of Islam where worship is the center of their life not the life itself. So the life itself is just insignificant compared to worshiping God Almighty. That's, in a nutshell, the main differences. You. You're welcome. Any other question, guys? Huh? Come on. Am Firstly, I doing a good job? Good job. <laughs> Sorry? Yes. Firstly, thank you for the talk. Um, if there's something about Islam that you could change, what would it be? I don't have I don't have any uh, right to change because I have firm faith that everything within this faith is perfect. God Almighty said in the Quran, "This day I have perfected your religion for you, completed my favor upon you, and chosen Islam for you to be your way of life." So if God completed and perfected a way of life, who am I to come now and? Uh, I would rather uh, point at uh, the faults of some Muslims and some Muslim leaders, perhaps, and uh, criticize that. But Islam itself, I believe that it is a perfect way of life. Uh, that, you know, uh, it, it brought to me this peace uh, that we were talking about and happiness, uh, despite the fact that I didn't make the money that I was dreaming of, you know. <laughs> um, so yeah, so this basically. There was a question at the back, I think. Oh, is there a question? Yeah, he's preparing the mic. Oh, he has, okay. He has his own mic, you see? his own, okay. The power of this room, you know? No communal mic for Conrad. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for your talk there. You're and uh, a lot of parallels, actually, to the teachings that we often hear here mm -hmm. in terms of contentment uh, and peace coming about through letting go of what we want, letting go of desire. So it's really nice to hear it from the uh, perspective of, a, of another religion. Thank you. And... Um, one of my uh, favourite uh, Buddhist teachers is, is a teacher named Ajahn Nasarano, and he, uh, he lives in, uh, at Newbury Monastery just outside of Melbourne. But he often, when he teaches, he uses stories from Nasruddin. Uh, from? from Nasruddin, who was, was a Turkish okay. uh, Muslim mystic. Okay. And it um, doesn't, doesn't, doesn't look like you're familiar with Nasruddin. I, I was going to ask, because some of his stories are quite funny. And <laughs> I was wondering if you knew Nasruddin, if you could share uh, maybe a funny Nasruddin story. But oh, I, uh, I, I, don't, I don't recall the name. I, I am not familiar with the name, Nasruddin. Okay. Yeah, sorry, man. That's okay. Yeah, yeah no worries. <laughs> Unless your pronunciation is, uh, is terrible in the Arabic names. It, that's, uh, <laughs> it, could, it, could well, it could well be that, yeah. But, no, I, I'm not really familiar with the name. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, I would have yeah. loved, I love to have fun and, uh, and if that man is funny now, you, you gave me a homework to go and, and search his name. Yeah, yeah. Well, he's got some good stories. Maybe perhaps another, um, if you have any funny stories. Our teacher here, Ajahn Brahm, tends to teach um, with a lot of humor. 
And uh, if there's any kind of humour from Islam that you can yeah. share tonight. Yeah. Yeah. Imam, what Conrad's trying to say is that it's mandatory to tell bad jokes. <laughs> It's a ma mandatory one? <laughs> it's mandatory to share bad jokes at the Buddhist bad society. Bad jokes, yeah, it's yeah. mandatory. So if mandatory. you guys didn't laugh, yeah. I should We, we won't let you out the door. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, okay, so I, I will tell you a real a funny story that took place during the time when I was in search of that peace and when I was trying to pray and my wife was still Catholic. So what happened is uh, when, I w when I decided to pray on, uh, on that night, um, I took that corner, you know, dark room corner, and I start praying. And I remember a, an old man back in the days, my father used to take us to the mosque, and he would uh, tell the, that man, teach them how to pray. And this man would say, when you pray, remember four things. The Kaaba, do you know the Kaaba, the black cube in Mecca? That we go and visit every, so you say, visualize that Kaaba in front of you. And visualize paradise on your right, and the punishment on your left, and behind you is the angel of death who's waiting for you to finish your prayer so he can take your soul back. So uh, this story was always narrated to help us focus on our prayer, yeah, so we don't get distracted and so on. So I decided, okay, let me develop that focus now. So I start focusing, and, and, uh, and when I finish the prayer, uh, when we finish, we say, Assalamu Alaikum. We look at the right and we say, Peace be with you. And then we look at the left and we say the same. So when I looked at the back, when I'm saying, Assalamu Alaikum, I actually noticed that my wife is standing at the back. So I thought, I thought the angel of death already arrived. So. <laughs> but it turns out to be a different angel, you know, beautiful angel. <laughs> nice right. save. Thank you. <laughs> Any question? Any question, please? Feel free, any, or like, anything will go. Yes. You said that you had practiced or, you know, you at least followed your wife with Christianity. Yes. And then you did um, your own... So the following was not in, in the sense that I became a Christian. It's just whenever she, she was very devoted to go to the, the Catholic Church every Sunday, so I would just go with her. And whatever they do there, I would just follow. So, so did you feel there was a difference? Yeah, what yeah, I they didn't. Were doing and what uh, you were doing? So Catholicism didn't didn't hit uh, with me. Uh, what I liked about uh, is the um, the music because I was a musician and, and uh, they sing a lot and <laughs> so that's what I really liked in uh, that during those days. But spiritual spiritually wise, I I didn't uh, and. Uh, and because we grew up in Egypt, so we have a lot of Christians and, and a lot of Catholics as well. So I knew about the, the core beliefs of Christianity some, somehow. And the idea also did not uh, register with me. Uh, so I wasn't, I wasn't interested, to be honest, yeah, at that time. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Seems like you want to ask a follow-up oh, question. Oh, it's pretty okay, lively yeah, tonight. This the, is wonderful. The sister in the, in the front? Oh. Okay. Thank you for tonight. Thank you. Um, a, a difficult question because I only hear of the enormous inequality between men and women and how difficult it is for women, how backward. Um, it seems from the Western point of view that it's happening to go back even, it's even getting harder and harder for women. Could you please comment on that? Yes, absolutely. So in Islam, uh, it's very, very clear uh, God Almighty gave set of rewards for certain actions. And uh, when you read the Quran, how God Almighty speaks about those actions and the rewards, you will see that in every action, God is including men and women in those actions, which indicates absolute equality when it comes to uh, anything at all, except the roles. So in Islam, the roles that men play are not necessarily the same as women's roles. We, in Islam, we are not talking about absolute equality on all levels because that would be foolishness. 
what we what we call for what what islam calls for is equity the responsibilities and the roles and the rights for men and women would be different because we are also created differently physically we are different biologically we are different psychologically we are different so how could we be doing the same thing uh, you know without without some some uh, differences so and differences does not mean that any of the gender is less respected like being equal doesn't mean that we are the same and being different does not mean that one of us is better or one of us is less uh, in fact islam came to save women from being misused during the pre-islamic era so in a, a before Islam, before Islam comes, before Muhammad, peace be upon him, claim his prophethood, uh, having children, having girls, infants, was a bad luck. And uh, we have a lot of records where when whoever would uh, conceive a, a female child, they will actually bury her alive. And when Muhammad came, he prohibited that action. And he even said that on the Day of Judgment, those who were killed alive, they will question for what crimes they were killed. So God gave full right. In fact, in, uh, in terms of respecting parents, Muhammad, peace be upon him, gave 75% of the love and respect to, goes to women as opposed to men. Uh, when a man came to him uh, and he asked, who deserved the maximum love and respect in my life? He said, your mother. He said, who else? He said, your mother. Who else? He said, your mother. Who else? He said, your father. Three times over, the mother is giving that ultimate respect as... Uh, opposed to the father. So in on all aspects, you see uh, the rights of um, uh, of uh, if if you f if a father died and he left a brother and a sister, the brother inherits double the share. Do you know why? Because all his shares, both shares, are spent on his sister, and the sister keep her share for her for her own self. This is this is shows you the the ultimate respect that we have for women. But I do agree with you that in many cultures, women are not shown that respect. I agree. In many, and we don't want to name countries and all that, uh, but, but I grew up in a culture that sometimes women would not be given freedom, would not be given right to learn and so on. But that has got nothing to do with Islam because the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, for example, regarding knowledge, he say to acquire knowledge is an obligatory duty upon every Muslim, men and women. That's what the Prophet said. So, um, yeah, I hope, I hope this clarifies the... Do you have a question? Hey. Um, so you mentioned that <laughs> while you were praying, you felt like it's a humble act. So I guess my question is, how important is praying in this journey to reach God? And what sort of purpose does it serve to can pray? Can you repeat? Can you repeat? Yeah, for sure. Oh, can you hear me now? Yes. Um, so you were talking about how praying, um, it's a humble act. And I was just wondering how important it is to pray during this journey to reach God. And what is the purpose of praying? Okay, excellent. So, um, yeah, prayer for me was the cornerstone of uh, all the changes that happened in, in my life afterwards. And interestingly, the word, the word prayer in Arabic is uh, pronounced as salah. And salah comes from a root word which means connection. So when we pray, actually, we connect with our Creator. That's the main purpose. And that's why we pray five times a day. And in between, we pray even, we are encouraged to pray optional prayers. Because the more you are connected with God Almighty, the Creator, you will not lose your purpose of why you were created. So to, to answer the second part of your question, like what's the, uh, you said, what's the importance of prayer? And the second, yeah, so th the purpose is to reach to that ultimate um, goal in life after passing from this world is to reunite with your creator and uh, and in in islam the most important act of worship is the prayer and the prophet muhammad peace be upon him said if it is done properly without any corruption 
with, with urgency, everything else will follow. Everything else will fall into the right place. And if it is done incorrectly and uh, on haste and without paying attention to it, everything else also will be crumbled. And that's, that's uh, how important prayer in, in Islam. Yes. Yes. She's loud enough. <laughs> yeah. uh, I've got a follow-up question, and that is, I think, to my knowledge, um, praying occurs at specific times in the day. Do the times represent uh, anything? They, they just represent, again, they represent the connection between yourself, the servant of God Almighty, and God Almighty throughout the day, throughout the 24 hours. We start praying at dawn. So the first prayer starts at dawn. So right now it's uh, quite fancy. It's 5.40 in the morning, which, which is easy, manageable. But at a certain point in, in the year, we sometimes wake up at 3 a.m., 3.15 to pray. So no matter what time uh, dawn is, we have to get up, leave the bed, and forsake that warm bed even in the coldest weather. And we say that, you know... Uh, come to success. That, that's the ultimate success, is to connect with God Almighty. And then everything, the world will run to you. Whatever you wanted, actually, God will give it to you in this world and in the next. And then we pray during noontime. So when, when the sun reaches its zenith, they call it, like around 12 noon, 1. Um, and then late afternoon, 3.30 to 4 o'clock, we pray another one. And then uh, around sunset, immediately after sunset, and then the late night prayer around 8, 9 p.m. And we sleep, we rest, and we get up again. And we go through that cycle of prayers to connect with our Creator. So there is no like symbolic meaning to, to these times other than just connect with God throughout the day. Because without Him, we believe, without His aid, without His support, we are nothing. We can't, we can't survive on our own. So that would be, I think, the last one, isn't it? Yeah? Okay. I'm not sure how this is going to come out. Don't um, worry. Just so when you pray, are you, um, is it your words that you're listening to? Is it what are you feeling inside your body? And uh, do you mean that a person could not have that? What prayer gives you, are you saying that a person can't have that naturally within them unless they're praying? Is that what you're... you're no, no, can you, can you repeat? Sorry, I didn't get... Uh, what I'm trying to say is when you pray, do you pray, are you, are you speaking words or are you silent inside? What's happening to your body? Um, and that whatever you receive, what you receive from that, are you saying can only be received that way? It can't just be a natural part of a person. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I understand. So in Islam, there are um, yes, in, in Islam there are a lot of um, uh, there are different types of prayers. So there is one that is fixed. God Almighty directed us on the way how to pray exactly. This is the ultimate way. And there is another way where we actually can say whatever we want to say to God. So we spend some time with God, asking Him for anything that we desire whether this thing related to this world or the next. And there is another form of prayer called munaja. Munaja means to actually just think about God Almighty. Just silence, sit, and think about God Almighty. Uh, now, these, these prayers and supplications are felt differently from one person to another. You'll find people praying standing, for example, and reciting in that fashion, if you don't mind me reciting. Do you mind me? Go, go for for example, uh, we say Allahu Akbar, the word that the brother mentioned earlier. Allahu Akbar is not a terrorist word. It's actually a word to celebrate the greatness of God. It means God greater. God is greater than anything. So after we say that, to, to declare that, we, we are leaving behind everything else because God is greater than anything now. And then we start praying. So we say, for example, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين That's an example. We praise God, the Lord of the worlds. 
the, more, the merciful, the most compassionate. And we call upon him, we say, you alone we worship, and you alone we ask for help. I have seen people shedding tears reciting this. And I have seen people laughing, like they have nothing, no effect whatsoever. So, and I, I, I talk to my, my scholars like, on this, like why people feel differently about prayers. And they say it's just that spot in the heart. There are people who are really connected already, and that's why their feelings are different, and this is how they react to what they say. And there are people who are not yet there. They just need to work harder. Maybe they are more attached to this world. That's why they don't feel the sweetness of prayer. So it's like the, um, you know, the, the question I wanted to, it's more of a, um, a penny-dropping moment, I guess, so I work in a large-ish corporate organisation, we'll say, and there's many different cultures there. It's, it's really quite diverse. And some of my, my sisters are Muslim sisters, and each um, week we, we have a meditation together. And it's a shame we couldn't show the movie because one of the things the ladies were saying was that when they wear the hijab, it's not as a sign of submission to a man. It's about submitting to, their, to Allah, to, to their God. It, and I was really touched when my um, Muslim workmate said to me, I really enjoy just sitting meditating because it brings me closer to my God within. And I think that's what my, my friend was trying to say, is that... You know, when you pray and you say those beautiful words, is it an act of channeling the, or submitting to the God within? Yeah. Or when you wear the... Yeah, de the definitely, uh, partially. partially. We, we don't explain it this way, though. Mm -hmm. So the, the, even the hijab part, the hijab part is submitting to God because he commanded us that this is the appropriate way to conduct ourselves. And by the way, there is hijab for men as well. So hijab is not only for women, hijab is for men and women. Just the parts that we cover are not necessarily the part they cover. Because as I mentioned earlier, even though we're equal spiritually on all levels, we're physically different. So we have to also conduct ourselves in, in some different ways. So, so putting on hijab in the heat uh, some, some people will come and say to my wife or to my daughter, don't you feel hot? Yes, they do. <laughs> well, we do. We are not like magicians, like we wear hijab and we don't feel hot. They feel hot. And you can ask them after me. And I don't talk on their behalf, but they do. We all do feel, feel the heat. But it's their submission to God's will that overrides any other desire that they have. So they feel hot, but they take the heat and expect the reward later on and the sweetness of the breeze in, in paradise later on. But for now, this is the requirement that we do to uh, prove our sincerity to God Almighty through action. Yeah. Thank you. Well, You're I welcome. think that we will um, wind it up there because it's 9 o'clock. And I had a bit of an idea. Um, I don't know if this is appropriate or not, but we always pay respects to the Buddha, Dharma, Sangha, and I was wondering maybe... If you could chant us a prayer, and then we'll pay our respects. I, I, I just see it as sure. a nice gesture of interfaith sure. friendship. So you'd like me to... Yeah. In Arabic is fine for yeah, you Yeah, Arabic is wonderful. Because <laughs> we'll chant in Pali. Okay. <laughs> so if you go first, and then we'll go. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم الله لا إله إلا هو الحي القيوم لا تأخذه سنة ولا نوم له ما في السماوات وما في الأرض من ذا الذي يشفع عنده إلا بإذنه يعلم ما بين أيديهم وما خلفهم 
ولا يحيطون بشيء من علمه إلا بما شاء وسع كرسيه السماوات والأرض ولا يؤده حفظهما وهو العلي العظيم Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot. I really appreciate uh, everything here, guys, and thank you so much for the invitation. And uh, looking forward to see you again, hopefully. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. In return, we'll just do our paying respects. Araham Sama Sambuddho Bhagawa Bhutam Bhagawanta Mabhivademi Svakato Bhagawata Dhammo Dhammam Namasami Supati Pano Bhagavato Sawaka Sango Sangam Namami Bodham Dhamam Sangam Namasami Thank you.